turn with me tonight to the book of Isaiah chapter 25. We're going to be in chapter 25 tonight. This chapter is 12 verses long and I believe with the help of the Lord I think we can cover this chapter tonight. Take a look at these verses. And I'm thrilled to be able to get to this chapter because we have seen chapter after chapter after chapter of doom and gloom and judgment and wrath and finally we come to a chapter, it has some judgment in it, but we come to a chapter that is filled with the exaltation and praise to the Lord. And I am glad to finally come to a more comforting word in our study of the book of Isaiah. And so we're going to talk about that tonight. You know, one of the questions that we'll, we'll talk about this also Sunday night some, but one of the things that we, you and I have to ask and answer is, can there be joy in the midst of sadness? Can there be joy in the midst of sorrow? And the answer to that is yes. Can there be worship? Can there be praise? Can there even be gladness in the time of difficulty? The answer to that is yes, if we know where to turn and we know what to do. And that's a little bit of what Isaiah is going to talk to us about tonight. Right here sandwiched in the midst of chapters that have to do with the judgment of the Lord and the fall upon nation, upon nation, people groups, upon people groups. Here we come to this 25th chapter and it goes this way. O Lord, Thou art my God. I will exalt Thee. I will praise Thy name. For Thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. For thou hast made of a city and heap, of a defensed city a ruin, a palace of strangers to be no city, it shall never be built. Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee, the city of the terrible nation shall fear thee. For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat. When the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall, thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers as the heat in a dry place, even the heat with the shadow of a cloud. The branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make, all, make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth for the Lord had spoken it. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for Him, and He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. We will be glad and rejoice in His salvation. For in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest, and Moab shall be trodden down under Him, even as straw is trodden down for the dunghill. And He shall spread forth His hands in the midst of them, As he that swimmeth spreadeth forth his hands to swim, and he shall bring down their pride together with the spoils of their hands. And the fortress of the high fort of thy walls shall shall he bring down, lay low, and bring to the ground, even to the dust. And so in this 25th chapter, there is a a rejoicing, there is a praise, a celebration Uh, unto God for his mighty acts. And of course, among his mighty acts is that God will take revenge upon the enemy of his people and he will bring them down and he will destroy their cities and they will never be rebuilt. And his people shall rejoice and the reproach of his people shall be removed. I mean, there's reason here to worship God, to praise God. Church, I want to tell you there is nothing that will suffice for praise. There's nothing that will suffice for worship in the body of Christ. We have to have it. And as I'll show us tonight, I firmly believe that the challenge or the command to worship God 
to extol the Lord and magnify the Lord is equally as important as the command in Scripture for us to pray. Pray and praise. Pray and worship. Pray and exalt the Lord. Because there are things that happen to us when we worship God that can come to us no other way. When there is authentic worship, it becomes an antidote to the frustration of our day. Boy, and it's a frustrating day. But praise and worship becomes a fix to all of that, if you will. When I worship the Lord, it puts me in touch with God and shapes my whole life. When I worship the Lord, it settles the conflict between good and evil that we experience in our lives every single day. It settles that. I'm going to have that conflict, but worship settles that. We leave worship with a personal assurance that the battle is won. And you might not get that assurance if you don't worship Him and acknowledge Him as such. Worship celebrates the truths that give direction to my life. Worship connects me with the past and it gives meaning to the present. My life has meaning, folks. There's significance to my life. Not because I'm anybody, not because I've done anything or will do anything, but because I'm who, of whom I'm connected with. His purpose becomes my purpose. His life becomes my life. And I am reminded of that in worship. Worship shows me the source of my values. It shows me the energy that holds my life together and the purpose of my work. And so this 25th chapter of Isaiah is really, more than anything else, a chapter on worship. And we're going to see it as such. Finally, a chapter, and there'll be plenty more to come, of promise and praise. And here's how it starts. Thou art my God. That's a real good way to start worshiping the Lord. Remind yourself that He is your God. You are His child. Thou art my God, I will exalt thee, I will praise thy name. When you go back in the Bible, the first instance of worship is really found in the story of Cain and Abel, bringing sacrifice, if you will, or bringing to an altar something to acknowledge God. And early on in the Bible, worship began with altars and with sacrifices. And they were primarily thank offerings they brought before the Lord to thank Him for all of His mighty deeds. In fact, the great song of Moses in the 15th chapter of Exodus that becomes a kind of pattern for our worship is thanking God for what He had just done in delivering them through the Red Sea and defeating the armies of Pharaoh. That's what worship is, and that's what it's always been. And worship, thanksgiving, is equal with prayer as being charged as a duty in Scripture. For example, there's not anybody here that would argue as a Christian that would argue over the necessity to pray. We know that we have to pray, and we're reminded of it over and over again, pray without ceasing. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Pray for one another, James says. There's no debating that. My house shall be called a house of prayer, Jesus said. We know we are to be praying people. But we are also to be praising people. Because there are also scriptures that command us to do that. Yes. Ephesians 5 and 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's praise. Yes. That's worship unto God. In Hebrews 13 and 15, by him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to His name. That's a command to believers to worship and praise God. We see in Philippians 4 and 6, with thanksgiving, 
Let your requests be made known unto God. There is worship, praise, and prayer in the same verse. And so, folks, it really doesn't matter our background, what kind of religious tradition we grew up in. We are commanded to be praying people and praising people. And that's how the prophet starts off this 25th chapter. I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name for the things that you have done. Did you know that the book of Psalms is the Israelites' Manual of devotion. That's how they view it. And in that, in that book of Psalms, there is so much praise unto God. Everything that hath breath is to praise God. Amen. And so praise is a high priority for believers. Now let me say something that might sort of startle you a little bit. Praise in its nature is a higher religious exercise than prayer. Praise in its nature is a higher religious exercise than prayer. How so, Pastor? Well, in prayer, we approach God for our sakes. God, I have this need. God, I come to you with this request. God, I bring my petition. I desire something from God, and so I go to God in prayer. Prayer is something we approach God for our own sakes. In praise, we have no selfish ambition. In praise, we come to God simply to honor God by setting forth His qualities. That's a higher purpose right there, folks. That's a higher purpose. We love Him. We adore Him. Praise is the enduring attitude of the angels. Did you know there aren't examples in the Bible of angels praying? Because they don't have to pray. They praise all the time. They live to praise Him. It's a higher spiritual discipline. Prayer implies imperfection. I'm imperfect, so I need to go to God, the perfect God, and I need to call upon Him with my need. It implies imperfection. Prayer implies need. It implies defect of nature. Don't you just love it when you buy something and you take it home and it's defective? And if there's a hundred of them on the shelf and one is defective, that's the one I'll pick up and take home. Don't you hate that? I absolutely hate that. You follow the directions. You follow the instructions to the letter. It's even got pictures of how this thing goes together and is supposed to work. And it doesn't work. I can't stand that. It drives me crazy when that happens. Incompetence is what that is. And it just drives me insane. Right? Well, guess what? I'm imperfect. And you're imperfect. And when I go to God in prayer, I am made to be, I am reminded of the fact that there's a defect in my nature. And I need to go to God to help me. And so do you, that's prayer, and that's necessary. I'm not trying to pit prayer and praise against one another. They are, oh, so necessary, both of them. But praise is appropriate when there is no imperfection, when all of the needs have been met and all of the prayers have been answered, there is still always praise before us. Because praise centers on God. Prayer belongs to the probation period of our existence down here. But praise will ring on through the vaults of heaven for all of eternity. When we get up there, we won't be praying. We won't, we'll be like the angels. We won't have a need to pray for. We will have made it. We will have arrived. We will have received the fruition of our faith. There won't be any prayers. But for all of eternity, we will praise God. And so he starts off, O Lord, thou art my God, I will exalt thee, I will praise thee, for thou hast done wonderful things. The cry of the heavenly Jerusalem, the Bible says, is this, great and marvelous are thy works. So 
When you're feeling down and out, when you're sad, and a lot of sadness right now, a lot of grief and pain and sorrow, a lot of tragedy, try praising God in the midst of that sorrow. Try focusing on the goodness of God and the blessing of God and extolling His name and see what a difference it makes in your life. There can be joy in sadness if we will acknowledge God. Oh Lord, Thou art my God. That's something unique. That was something unique to the Hebrews. That's something unique to us. Other nations have their gods. Other nations had their gods. And their gods were primarily known as leaders of war or protectors of the nation as such. And our God is all of that. But that's about as far as it went with them. We have the unique blessing to be able to bow before him, to be able to approach his throne with boldness and say, God, you are my God. Amen. Amen. And there's a uniqueness about that that we ought to be thankful for and we ought to take advantage of. They could not rejoice in their gods, other nations, and could not paint the character of their gods in the same colors that Israel could because of the personal relationship and because of the mighty deeds he had done for them. So Jehovah God is not just my daddy's God or my mama's God or my grandparents' God or my church's God or my pastor's God. He is my God. He is my God. Amen. I have a relationship with him. I can talk to him. I can call upon him and I can hear his voice. And so we worship him as such. This is what we're called to do. And as the prophet extols us and the people in worship, listen to what he says. For thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. Man, that's, that's rich stuff right there. The counsels of the Lord, the Bible said, standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Amen. The lapse of time, the passing of centuries, makes not the faintest difference in the world as to the faithfulness and the certainty of the promise of God. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness. And you can put all your weight on the faithfulness of God and he'll hold you up. Amen. He'll keep you up. And don't you forget that. To God, to God, his counsels are wisdom and they are of old. In other words, God's thoughts are not off the cuff inspirations. They're not accidental. They don't spring up like ours do in no fixed order. Sometimes I'll say something to to my daughter, it's kind of a youth thing, I guess. I'll say something to my daughter or my son and, and, or any young person as far as that goes. And, and sometimes they'll say, well, that was random. And I'm like, what, what kind of language do y'all have? Well, that was random. And, and I'm thinking, no, not really, but I guess you see it as such. Well, God doesn't have random thoughts. No, no he doesn't have random thoughts or actions. God knows exactly what he's saying. God knows exactly when he's saying it. And God knows exactly what he's going to do. Amen. And his counsels are wisdom. His counsels are faithfulness. Amen. To God, nothing is sudden or unforeseen. He says, thy counsels of old. Nothing sudden about what God does. There might be a suddenness to our discovering what God does or says. There might be a suddenness to our awareness of the presence of the Lord or the will of the Lord. But there is no suddenness to what God, to God, what he is saying and what he is doing. So the unexpected for us is going to always happen, but never with God there's no unexpected anything with God. All things were ordained by him before the foundation of the world. Listen to what the apostle said in Acts 15 and 18. Known unto God are all his works 
from the beginning of the world. Wow. That's who you serve. And that's who you know. That's your God. In verse 2 he says, For thou hast made of a city a heap, of a defense city a ruin, a place of strangers to be no city. It shall never be built. The imperial city, in other words, the city of Israel's oppressors is who's being referred to here. God is destroying them. And they're going to become a heap of stones. And the palaces will never again rise out of the ruins. That's a good reason to praise God. And there you go again. We see this all the time. You've heard me make reference to this time and time again in the Bible. One of the great causes of praise to God beyond his counsel and his wisdom and his mighty acts is the fact that he defeats and destroys the wicked. And one of the proper characteristics for the believer is to praise and rejoice God uh, in God because of him being righteous in all of his judgments. And when the devil's defeated and the devil's kind is defeated and the devil's plan and purpose is defeated, we should rejoice over that. Amen. And that's what he's doing here. So it's symbolic in its fate. He's talking about a literal city here, particularly Moab at this time. But it's symbolic also of unbelief, of pride and power that exalts itself against God and against truth in all ages. So the enemy of God's people is being defeated and going to be defeated. And we should rejoice over that. The hand of the Lord is outspread compassionately. Listen to verse 3. Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee. The city of the terrible nations shall fear thee. Because of what you're going to do and how you're going to bring about deliverance for your people and judge the wickedness of the people, they are going to see your hand at work and they are going to praise you too. They're going to acknowledge you for who you are. So the effect upon the wicked is that they will honor the God of Israel. The former oppressors of Israel will bow down in fear before him. It seems like I've read somewhere every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So when you see the political mess that you're seeing today, that we're seeing today, when you see uh, pandemics and sickness and death and sorrow, man, it can be overwhelming. I know that. I know that. It can. But you just remember what you know. Who's in charge? Who's in control? Who's above and before all of it? And who eventually is going to bring us out of it? Verse 4, For thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat. That's description of the work of God. God has always, in every age, Regarded the poor and regarded the needy. And he's always, for those who are downtrodden and suffering, he's always been a compassionate God for those that would look to him. He refers to him here as a refuge from the storm. I'm going to tell you something that you already know and you've heard me say it and you've heard other preachers say it. You will come to know the goodness of God and you will come to know the character and the blessing of God. You will come to know Him more in times of sorrow, in times of tragedy, in the time of the storm than you ever will in times of victory. It's just, life is just that way. Because we recognize our own inadequacies more in times like that. We recognize our own neediness more in times like that. And we lean more upon God. Someone said the calm unbroken smile of the summer day does not so reveal God to us in his power and goodness as the thunder and the lightning followed by the refreshing rain. I believe that. And, and the prophet here is praising God and thanking him for being a refuge from the storm. Now, I'm going to hurry here because when you get to this seventh verse, there's a string of verses here. Let's look at these three verses, verse 7 through 10 or four verses. 
He will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from all the earth for the Lord hath spoken it. Now, let me ask you, when you read that and when you hear those words, does that... That kind of speaks to a future time, doesn't it? In other words, as we've said before in Isaiah, there is a near fulfillment to prophecy and there is a far off fulfillment to prophecy. And a lot of what he describes right there is a description of what's going to happen in a millennial day that is yet to come. And in verse 9 he says, It shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest. Isaiah is prophesying about a future day of blessing and rest and prosperity for the people of God. And that day is coming. That day is coming. All that he says about God, about him, for example, being a strength to the poor and a strength to the needy, a refuge in the storm, all that he has said about God, human history will endorse the record of God being that. But now, he says there's going to be more than all of this. In verse 8, and the Lord will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from all the earth. I want to tell you, Israel, the nation of Israel has suffered the rebuke of nations. And it has had shame put upon it. Uh, This this, uh, thing we saw this week in the news, it was anti-Semitic. This kidnapping of these four people. And it was anti-Semitic. And we're seeing that all. Think back to the Holocaust. The shame that was cast upon millions and millions of Jews, the people of God. There has been, down through the centuries, there has been a rebuke of the people of the Lord and a shame that has been on the heart of the people of the Lord, the nation of Israel. But there's coming a day that God's going to wipe every bit of that away and they're going to be the exalted people of the earth again. Amen. And we are the church in the meantime. We are in this age of grace. And thank God we've been grafted in. They are the chosen ones. We have been adopted and grafted in. That's the only reason we're here. I thank him for that. But he's not finished with Israel. Don't you think for a moment he is. There is a great and glorious day. The reproaches so long leveled at his people, even in the dispersion, shall be taken away. And no more will the taunt be leveled at them. Where is your God now? They're going to find out one day where he is. And he's going to be the God of Israel. Amen. Sin will be eradicated. Tears of shame and death will be gone. Listen to what he says here in verse 8. He will swallow up death in victory. Well, I believe he did that. I believe he did that after Golgotha's hill. He defeated death, hell, and the grave. He defeated the devil, made a show of him openly. Amen. And holds the keys of hell and death. Amen. He did it. He's already done it. Isaiah is prophesying about a day when it shall happen. And that future day, it's amazing. It's seen by the prophet. Think about that. Generations upon generations. Hundreds of years before the coming of Christ. Isaiah the prophet of God saw that day coming. And it came. Death. He will swallow up death in victory. Oh, how timely that is. We just lost a brother in death. We just lost a sister in death a week or so ago. We've lost a number of people, as have so many places and so many families. Death, what a terrible, terrible thing that dogs our footsteps, that darkens our days with fear, that breaks in upon all dreams of perfect friendship and permanent joy. Death. 
which is an invisible monarch that holds empire in so many hearts. Death will be ultimately one day totally destroyed because of the accomplished work of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And that's why Brother Malcolm could say what he did, and it's the truth, that Brother Bob Keith's having church tonight. That's why we can say that with the fullest of confidence, that those saints that have gone before us are, are in the presence of the Lord, worshiping the Lord in fullness right now, this very moment, while you're sitting there on that pew. That's what's happening in real time, in reality. Hallelujah. Because of the accomplished work of Jesus in defeating death. Praise God. And this prophet, all that long time ago, this prophet saw that. And he is here looking from the same point of view as Paul looked, as John the Revelator looked. In that last book of the Bible, that last point of distant perspective known as the day of redemption. Hallelujah. The prophet Isaiah saw that day and, and saw that day as a cause for worshiping God. Thou art my God, I will praise thee. Oh, hallelujah. We need to do more of that. Stand up with me, church. We need to do more of that. And we must do more of that, especially in times of sorrow and sadness. In fact, I'm a firm believer that the worse it gets, the more praise ought to go forth. The, the worse it gets, the more prayer and praise ought to come up from the children of God. Because that's the only way you get that dark cloud to, to split and move aside. And the heavens open up, amen, and the glory of the Lord fall upon us. Can we praise Him in closing here tonight? Heavenly Father, we praise You. We thank You for Jesus. And we thank you for the work, oh, hallelujah, that you've done for us. Your great deeds and exploits. You are to be praised. You're worthy to be magnified. And we praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. We offer the sacrifice of praise unto the Lord. For you are worthy of it. In Christ's precious, glorious name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.